So no talk of murder, hate, and adultery and divorce today, thank goodness. <laughs> and we have the portion from Leviticus that really is more about a relationship to the world and to each other than anything else. I think Father Rob and I have done a good job of showing what the Gospels mean for the people of God today. But I'm not sure if we've really kind of set you up with the context for the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus indeed is speaking to his disciples in a very long, long sermon. But what you don't know is those disciples, those Jewish persons who have become his friends, his followers, are also living in Jerusalem, which is occupied by the Roman government. Knowing that, a little piece of information is important because, especially for this part of Matthew, if we do not know that little piece of the context, at face value, we can read Matthew and say, I am to allow someone to physically or verbally hurt me, and I am not to do anything. I am to give to anybody who asks me of anything without discretion or judgment. If somebody asks me to work an hour, I'm to work two. But when you look deeper and when you know that this portion of Matthew, this portion of the Sermon on the Mount is reflective of the context, it's really more about how to respond to the Roman authorities as Jews under occupation in Jerusalem. For instance, when the gospel says someone hits you on the cheek, turn the other also. That sounds like just let someone stand and beat you up, doesn't it? Now we know that it's unwise and really unethical to, to do someone that way. But what we must remember is that for a Jewish citizen to do that in Jerusalem under Roman occupation meant that they were trying to live in peace. That when you did that, you were creating, when you turned that cheek, you were giving that Roman soldier, that Roman authority, I am your equal. Surely you do not want to strike someone who is as human as you. The Roman law said you had to walk one mile. They could only make you walk one mile as a punishment or simply because they were the Roman authority. They could make you do that. To go the second one is to go above and beyond. Knowing that we have a pretty clear understanding that in the, the people of God are to go above, to respond with nonviolence, to respond in love, to respond in ways that do not beget more violence. Very different than allowing someone to mistreat you or to abuse you. You've heard the phrase said when, when things go bad and you want to respond, don't respond the same way in which you were treated. Throughout my life in, in my family, my grandmother would always say, you fight back with education. You fight back with love. You fight back with seeing that person who has hurt you or oppressed you or whatever they have done to you with love. To do that in our culture today is very difficult. 
but yet we have the examples of those persons during the civil rights movement who trained, who were trained to be nonviolent. Yes, they did suffer some at, at the hands of water hoses and dogs and various things, but they were trained that love and nonviolence was the way to win over oppression, evil, or injustice. I recently watched a clip of John Lewis talking about his participation in that as a young man. As a person post-civil rights, I have no idea how he withstood that. But what I did learn through this clip is that they had training sessions on nonviolence sort of a mock session of, I'm going to say this to you, I'm going to do this to you, and you are not to respond with a strike. You are to respond with love. And one of the things I found most fascinating was that the trainers for the nonviolent movement said, when someone is speaking something derogatory to you, you look them in the eye. Never drop your gaze. The equivalent of turning the other cheek, the equivalent of saying, I see you as a human being, just as I am a human being whom you are physically or verbally or systematically <laughs> oppressing. As we know through the civil rights movement, the power behind that movement was not violence. The power was love. The power was overcoming darkness with light. And remember the gospel a few Sundays ago. Let your light shine so that it may glorify your Father in heaven. To love our neighbors as ourselves is that very thing that makes our light shine in the darkness. To love ourselves as those in whom God himself dwells as individuals and as the body of Christ means that we care for ourselves, our physical bodies. We care for this physical body. We remember that God dwells in us we do not allow ourselves to be abused or used. It means that we protest and protect the bodies of the innocent, those who are helpless or dependent upon us somehow. It means that what we desire and hope for ourselves and our families, we hope for all of God's creation. In this, we shine. We reflect the light of Jesus Christ that is within us. So what does that look like? Well, it means that we feed the hungry because we are hungry. And we have food that we can access and grab to eat. It means that in the way that God leads us, we try to provide for those who are hungry. We have a job. It may mean that we go and help with job training so that others may enjoy the same satisfaction of a vocation that we have. It may mean that we help someone through a program go to Greenville Tech or to Spartanburg Methodist College. It may mean that we participate in a scholarship program to help those who want to be educated become educated. It may mean that when we encounter someone who is poor in spirit, remember the Beatitudes? That we give hope. It may be that we are present silently when someone is grieving. It may be someone we know, it may be someone we don't. It may be that we see the other as ourselves with the same wants and desires and hopes and aspirations as we have. Now, when you come to the give to anyone who asks of you and begs of you and do not refuse and borrow, 
Now you're going to say, Mother Mia, does that mean that I have to give anything to anybody that they ask of me? Yes, no, maybe, sometimes. <laughs> See, there's not an easy answer for that, is it? The easy answer is be generous, to give. We have people on our corners, right, who have signs. We'll work for food or need food or need money. Sometimes people feel safe enough to give them money. Sometimes some groups, as we talked about uh, in our DOK meeting, give them something called a blessing bag that has soap and hand lotions and toiletries and maybe a protein bar or a bottle of water in the bag. That's a way of responding. It may be safe for you to do so. It may not be safe for you to do so. But what we cannot do is act as if those persons are not there. Act as if they have no heart, no hope. Act as if they do not have the same desires that we have. If we do not feel safe to give money, or we don't happen to have a handy blessing bag in the car, we can at least pray for them. We can at least say, God, please give that person what they need and beyond what they think they need. Give them life. Give them a sense of purpose and a better situation than they have. Y'all have it easy. You have on your regular street clothes when you drive around those corners, don't you? If I've got this on, I've got a whole nother level to think about, right? So as I advise you, sometimes yes, sometimes no. If I have money, I give money. If it's safe for me to do so, I do so. The story Father Rob told at Clergy Bible Study this week, and I may not tell it all, tell it all incorrectly, that a woman came to him and he, and he assumed and she that she wanted money, or that she wanted food. And he led with, I don't have money, we, don't, we can't help you with that level of, of expense, and we, I don't have food right now. I'm happy to go get you something or give you, go to Walmart and get food. And do you know she was upset with him because she, he had not offered to simply pray with her. What she really wanted was prayer. Maybe she realized that all of her wants and desires and what she lacked would be answered through prayer. I've done that many times myself, assumed that the person wanted money or food and that they were going to go use it for something like buying cigarettes or buying alcohol. And one day I realized, a wise older priest told me, it's not up to you to decide what they're going to do with the money you give. It's up to you to decide to give or not. Once you, God has, you have gone the way God has called you to go, it is for that person who has received to do right with that or not. But you have acted in faith, you have seen the need and filled it. So what about corners and edges that Leviticus talks about? What does corners and edges look like today? Mainly it looks like feeding ministries, community gardens, meals on wheels, mobile meals, free hot dog suppers to a community. Many churches have community functions and they open that food up to the entire community. Many communities, when they have leftover food, take it to Miracle Hill or take it to a local shelter rather than waste the food or throw it away or give it to your priests who get bigger each year. 
they decide to take the food to a program or to a shelter where it can be used and enjoyed. It looks like the various backpack programs where churches fill backpacks with food and snacks and vitals for the weekend for children who are poor, whom teachers have realized come to school hungry so that they can eat for the weekends. Many of you may not remember last year that our vacation Bible school was called Abundant Orchard. Abundant Orchard actually went out and did a gleaning project to pick up the things that were left, the vegetables to give away for the poor, for the hungry. On the surface, that looks like just a way to get a, a, a person's crops cleaned up and their fields cleaned up. But in the days of the Old Testament, Leviticus, that particular admonition was more about the relationship that we had, that they had with each other, the relationships we have with all of God's people. So when we think that these laws and rules are just about laws and rules, they're about something much deeper. The whole law, of, the rule of law of the Torah is relationship right relationship to God, right relationship to others, means that we think about those who have less than we do. I've gotten several questions about how we live together in our own day with differing viewpoints and diverse political understandings. Remember the sermon I preached about the cross that we receive at baptism? We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. One way that we can deal with those who are differing than us, those who sit on the same pew that have totally different viewpoints, is to remember that all of us have a cross on our heads. We belong to Christ. We belong to Christ. And that person who has a different view, a different understanding, different whatever, is one for whom Christ died. I remember telling you, you probably get tired of me hearing me preach that. But it's the essential core of our faith. And even those outside of this place are still ones for whom Christ died, whether they have accepted Christ or wear the name Christian or not. They are still God's creation. They are still those who have hearts and souls and desires, same as we. So when we love our neighbor as ourselves, we may intentionally re recall that this person who is other is just like myself. That intentionality, that intentional recalling and remembering it's what creates over time compassion and grace within us so that we see all of God's people as our neighbors and thereby are able to love them as ourselves. Amen.